So Blake, uh, we got to know each other back in October. Um, yeah. Had an opportunity to kind of do a socially distanced outdoor kind of hangout, and yeah, it was, that was that was like one of my first or maybe only in person meetings. <laughs> in you know. Yeah, I know. And so it was fun. It was just neat to hear kind of where you have been from, come from uh, in relation to kind of just your career. But I don't know a lot about your backstory. And so I'd be curious, where, where are you from originally? How did you end up in the Bay Area? Um, and we'll kind of take it from there, you know, how you got into the world of blockchain. But where are you originally from? What was life growing like growing up for you? Yeah, so I was born in Baltimore, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, you know, um, for those who aren't familiar, it's you know uh, just about an hour outside of DC, <clears throat> and um, grew up. Well, you know, my, my dad was a uh, a banker. My mom was a nurse, and um, you know, I had a, I don't know, it's a pretty pretty like kind of normal middle class life growing up uh, in in Baltimore. And then um, in college, I, I spent. Uh, I was at Wharton, so I was doing uh, business school there. And, you know, I think I kind of did that because I really wasn't that sure what I like actually wanted to do, but I like vaguely liked this idea of starting businesses or like starting stuff. I, I was definitely like, um, like I remember doing, doing uh, like lemonade stands and stuff as a kid. I've, <clears throat> I've liked having a bit of that uh, <laughs> entrepreneurial spirit, started like clubs and stuff in, in high school and things like that. Um, that, that was the only like vague direction I had, but I wasn't really sure. And then it turned out that actually in business school, like most of what they're preparing you for is to be like an investment banker or a consultant. <laughs> and, um, so by the time that was ending, I was realizing that, like, I saw the writing on the wall of like, oh, that's, that's what you do coming in here. And so I, I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> um, mm. and then I've had this other, uh, kind of very strong passion throughout my life, which has been music. And so I, um, I was in a band in college and at the end of college, I decided I was like, you know, I don't want to do any of this business stuff. I don't want to be a consultant. I don't want to be a banker. Let's just do a band. And so um, I, me and the guitarist from that band um, left, and we didn't have any jobs or anything, but we just went and moved to Austin, Texas mm. uh, to do music full time. <clears throat> and so that's what I did there for four years. I played in a bunch of bands, um, like produced some albums, taught a lot of lessons. Um, wow. Did, just was kind of living music life, making like zero money. Uh, <laughs> living and, the dream. Yeah, no, but it, but it was fun. I had a, I had a great time and like met a lot of great people, um, a lot of great experiences. Um, I was like really different lifestyle. Even you know, grew up in Baltimore with my parents, so like being a really you know broke musician. And um, <clears throat> along the way, uh, I actually started a music lessons company while I was there. So I uh, I had a bunch of teachers, uh, not a bunch. I had a handful of teachers who kind of worked for me, and I would give them lessons. I taught a lot of lessons myself. Um, and that was also the time when I worked on one of the first, actually the second project uh, with my co-founder, Mike, who started Goldfinch with me. Um, me and him, while we were in Austin, we did this. Uh, we created a new music notation system to try and make it easier for kids to learn how to read music. Mm. And that's called Hummingbird Notation. You can still find it online. Um, it actually had like a pretty uh, good response, but like when we when we kind of announced it, um, but it was uh, you know it's it turns out it's really hard to create a, a music notation system that, <laughs> that everybody uses. You need like a lot of uh, infrastructure and stuff around you, and you need to translate thousands of pieces of music and things. So we kind of let that go aside. But um, that was a, one project that I was working on with my now co-founder. Um, and anyway, along that path, I was trying to um, I, I was I wanted to create an iPad app for kids to learn how to how to play piano and so i was doing these like youtube videos um teaching kids how to play songs and then i um, was trying to use this new music notation system we were coming up with and i wanted to have an ipad app that had a great experience for kids to use these videos as learning tools and so like i found a developer to help build that for me because at the time i didn't know how to do any software development of any kind mm. and um, and I didn't like no one around me did software development when I was growing up. My high school didn't have any software classes. There was just like no tech, really anything. Um, but I thought this tech stuff was kind of cool. So I was finding developers to build stuff for me. This was actually the third time I'd found a developer to build stuff for me. Before I tried to create a um, like a Facebook app for like getting sports events together, and I'd also try to create a music collaboration website while I was still in college. And so by this third time, I was like, oh, maybe I should I should like teach myself how to do some of this coding. And so I started getting books and things and started teaching myself how to code. 
<clears throat> and um, was taking online courses. This was also right around the time when like Coursera and Udacity were first coming out. And yeah. so I was taking all those free classes and um, started doing that for like a year or so. And uh, that's also then in like around 2013 was right when the very first software boot camps started. Yeah, I remember those. Um, so there was like Dev Bootcamp and uh, and what was the other one? There was Hack Reactor. It was the one I actually went to. And then there was a, some third ones that were all up then. And so ultimately, I, you know, I, I heard about these boot camps. I was like, oh, my God, in 12 weeks, you can make, you know, six times what I'm making right now. At a, <laughs> this is I like and I was sort of after four years of, you know, being a musician, I was like, maybe it's, it's time to like try something else. And uh, so that's when I, I applied to Hack Reactor. I was fortunate enough to get in and came up here to San Francisco to do that. And so that's what brought me to the Bay Area. That was in mid-2013. And so I've been so that's here. that's pretty... Yeah. So you've been in the Bay Area since 2013. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's a pretty... I mean, that's pretty interesting. So from a, you know, pretty, uh, pretty standard middle class kind of upbringing Baltimore, uh, music kind of... You did go to a great school. I mean, Wharton, amazing business school. Um, I'm curious because I've had several friends um, who were had just brilliant finance minds, um, but also were really good musicians. Uh, have you ever thought much about that or just kind of like your ability to kind of uh, is it what is it that about kind of this this one gentleman I'm thinking about in particular, he was a CPA, great at finance and an unbelievable saxophonist. I mean, the guy could just play. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, it's, it's funny you bring up the like finance music connection. So personally, I haven't seen. I guess maybe I, I don't talk with enough finance people or something to know the music connection side of that. But I've seen a big, big connection between engineers and uh, music. Yeah, I bet. Um, I bet. Like it's just a, a insane percentage of engineers that I know are either like really into music or they uh, actually play a lot. Um, and like, it, it seems to be like, like really high, like 30 or 40% like of, of the engineers I talk with are either like going to festivals all the time or they're actually playing or they're, you know, producing music in their bedroom, that kind of thing. Um, mm. and I, I've had a bunch of people ask me about that and we've talked about, it. I've talked about a bunch with the other engineers and stuff and like, I don't really know what it is. It's actually even funnier to, uh, to the guys who I was in a band with for a while while I was in Austin. I just found out that they became engineers too. They, huh. <laughs> like, you know, years later, uh, they kept doing the music thing for a little longer than I did, but they, they also, uh, you know, ended up doing the engineer thing. That's um, pretty cool. I, I don't I really know what it is. I think maybe it's like, uh, maybe it, there's something about music and engineering where you like, you take small things and you build big things out of small things, right? Like in music, you've only got 12 notes, right? You're just sitting there and yet you got to like create this all these songs and these layers and stuff on it and you only have really like you know a handful of of chords that get used regularly in pop music like it's just not that many and you've added these little building blocks you try and craft these like multi-layered um rich songs and things and i think engineering has a similar kind of mindset to it yeah so you're in you're in the bay area i think what's really interesting about your your backstory a little bit is that you really had no exposure to tech. You just kind of stumbled into it. I mean, I'm sure you had your own like interest in gaming or technology just as a young person growing up, but just not through the education system that that, that was an opportunity or an exposure that you might have, but then you're trying to build something, you constantly are going to other people to build it, and you start to figure out, maybe, maybe I could do this myself and, and kind of teach yourself and, and you know take some courses on, on how to become a, a software engineer. I mean, that's pretty impressive for trajectory, but I think one that's helpful because there's, it's not that formal education system that I think a lot of people have always turned to. Uh, and I think it's really kind of flipped our educational system upside down of late is that you can go and do, um, get, get this, this training in a very short period of time and, and, and make some decent money. Um, yeah. Has, and was that the, oh, go ahead. or we know what were you going to say? Yeah. I, I was just going to, just going to agree. I think software is like such a it, it, it's kind of a unique uh, job in that way. It's, it's one of the only like seriously professional jobs, I think, where there's not a lot of requirements, right? There's no legal license you have to have to get, um, there's no state-by-state -state license on being a software engineer. Um, and as the boot camps prove, it doesn't take years of training. It takes months of training, which is 
just, I mean, that's so much less time. You know, you're talking about, you know, yeah. many, many multiples uh, of less time required in order to become a software engineer for a job that has a ton of flexibility, a ton of demand, um, and for the right person is, is really a lot of fun. I would, I've told so many Lyft drivers about, <laughs> about software. Tech, they would ask me, like, what do you do? And I'd tell them, oh, I, I went into, did this hack manager thing. It was real short. I, I didn't even do tech before. They're all like, what? I want to do that. And I'm like, yeah, you should do it. Like, go for it. It's, it's, it's yeah. right there. Um, and yeah. I, I just think it's, it's really uh, inclusive in that way that so many people can do it. And you don't even need to go to a, a school at all. You can just teach yourself. There's so many free online resources. You know, it feels like a lot of other jobs try and put up barriers to other people yeah. getting in and, and software is like, no, please, we need as many as we can get. Come on in. <clears throat> yeah. And I have to believe too, like there's, there is the training, you know, the individualized, just learn it. Uh, it's accessible. But what I've also been interested in, I'm curious about just kind of where you went from the, from the hacker training to kind of where you are today. Uh, this, this idea of like kind of almost like get the basics. And then you, when you work, like there's more of this old school apprentice where you're going to learn a lot of this just by doing it. Yeah, you know, on yep. the job training, kind of like trying, breaking things, putting it back together. What was that like for you just kind of in the early days, you know, and then getting to where you are today as, you know, a founder of a, of a really interesting new blockchain strategy? Um, what, what, how did you, how did you feel that out? Did you, did you, were you expected on day one when you were coming to work at Coinbase, your previous job or, or others? To, to be the, the the expert or was there some expectation that you're just gonna you're gonna break some things and fix it yeah um, I'd say definitely ex expectation you're gonna you're gonna break things and, and fix it um, <clears throat> especially especially as a junior engineer if you're coming in for your first job I think it's a little different uh, like if you go when I went to work at coinbase I joined as a senior engineer and that you know they're, I should, they're not expecting you to break things. <laughs> they're expecting <laughs> you to. Uh, they are expecting you to have questions. They're expecting you to not know how things are going to work, and you're going to talk yeah. to your other colleagues to figure that out. But uh, they're not expecting you to break things. Um, you come in as a junior engineer. I got really lucky to join. Actually, my first job um, as an engineer, I joined. The, I was the first employee at a at a startup, at a healthcare startup, and uh, so I was working directly with the founder slash CTO on mm -hmm. a lot of code, and so. He really was my mentor, and you know, uh, I was the apprentice in that relationship. It was my first job. He had had ten years of experience, and so I just learned a ton from him. Um, and I think that model it, it really works well. Um, I would that'd be a small piece of advice if anybody here is you know trying to think about getting into software. Like, try and find a job where you can have a mentor who's who's likes mentoring people. You know, um, it's yeah. fun for certain engineers. Others others don't like doing it, and they they want to just code and that's totally fine but there are some who really enjoy doing it find one of those people if it's if it's early on it's going to be invaluable to you so what was it like uh, no that's that's super helpful and i think the advice of a mentor because you're right though too because um not everybody wants to be a mentor not everybody's a good mentor <laughs> and yeah, so they're great at you know what i mean like some people yeah exactly some people just want to crank just leave me alone i i love doing the code i don't want to really help and that's fine you know and so i think it's good it's a good word of advice to you know, be intentional about finding someone that that is interested in kind of instilling that in the next the next person, the next generation. Yeah, uh, ask questions of your employer. Say, do you guys do mentorship programs? Like, who am I going to be working with? And talk to them, see if yeah. they're into that thing. Those are easy questions to ask, and people will give you straight answers on it usually. Yeah, that's great. So early days. So you you joined Coinbase. I don't know, uh, 2018. I think it was. Yeah, um, it was 2018. So, yeah. So I mean. Right around the time, kind of, there was the massive crypto dip. Um, what? How did you find yourself at Coinbase? Was it something where you're like you personally were interested in uh, digital digital currencies? Um, was it another tech job? At least when you first went to it. I mean, I know kind of in the Bay Area, you you kind of do that. People jump from one job to the next. What was that for you when you went to Coinbase and uh, were a senior engineer there? Yeah, so that was um, yeah, that was in 2018. So I'd been doing engineering for about four and a half years or so at that point, um, all at that healthcare startup where um, I was just mentioning. And so I was, um, you know, it, it was a mix of I was I was interested in digital currency stuff. I'd been uh, paying attention to it. it. Sort of, you know, I knew about it since 2013. My co-founder Mike has been uh, you know much more into it. I say earlier on than I was, and we so we were having conversations about it and stuff. I got more into it during 2017, the big run up. Obviously, there was a lot of news coverage and started to like, that's when I was like, okay, let me like read the Bitcoin white paper and let me like see what's going on here and um, started to like kind of get it a little bit more. And um, 
you know, I was getting, you know, pretty interested in crypto. At the same time, I was also starting to say like, hey, I think I want to move on from this startup. I think I want to like just get into a different experience, you know, maybe work with either a larger company or um, just have a different set of engineers that I'm learning from. And so um, <clears throat> I was, you know, so in the back of my mind, just looking for a new job in that way. And so uh, my, you know, co-founder Mike, he had started to work at Coinbase as well. And so he was encouraging me. He was like, hey, I think you should check out Coinbase. Like, it, it could fit really well, you know, you like crypto and you're looking for a new gig. And so I did. And so um, that was that, that was sort of what got me looking at it. And um, I was, you know, very intrigued by crypto. I think then I, I couldn't, I probably couldn't tell you like really concretely like, oh, I think crypto is going to do X, Y, Z. It was just like st still so new, but it seemed like it held so much potential. And I think, you know, just the more that I've been in the space, the more I see that potential clearer and the more I, I see crypto as being a really like and potentially just like fundamentally different way to organize digital life um, and I think as, as digital life becomes more and more important um, crypto is going to be playing a, a bigger role there it's in a lot of it, it's kind of like just this mirror image of the normal internet you know um, the regular internet is all about like abundance and crypto actually is kind of all about scarcity and regular like, internet you have like companies owning all your data crypto is about you owning all your data um, and uh, you know on a regular internet, it's, um, it's it's very kind of fragmented. But in the crypto space, we're all on one single you know data source and one single set of truth that we uh, that we have. And so, uh, yeah, I'm I'm just been super excited about it. I think uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how crypto, especially, takes things like marketplaces and and decentralizes the ownership there. So that like you know you think like an Airbnb or an Uber. This this was one of my like um, sort of light bulb moments when I was starting to get really deeper in, into crypto. Was realizing like oh my goodness, like you could have all the, the data that Uber or Airbnb have, and, but you could have like 20 interfaces on top of them all using the same data, right? And so instead of Airbnb having a monopoly on all that data there and being able to charge excess rates, you know, we're all owning that data ourselves. There can be many interfaces. We can all choose the interface that we like, and they're going to be forced to compete on things that actually customers appreciate and customers want, mm -hmm. rather than just being able to kind of sit on their data monopoly and force you and say you have no other choice but to like pay whatever fee we want to charge. Um, <clears throat> I think that's that's going to be some really cool use cases, and of course, uh, tons of others like what we're we're doing at Goldfinch. But um, um, before yeah. I'll kind of pause there and go into a rabbit hole of the crypto stuff. But yeah, that was that was kind of my my road to Coinbase. That's great. And I think it is a good segue uh, into kind of your current work at Goldfinch because, um, you know, it's, it's really impressive. The in, We got into kind of crypto investing back in 2017, kind of as the market was pretty hot and then it tanked, you know, and we were we were pretty, um, pretty excited about the, the blockchain itself. And we saw a lot of kind of hype at that time where people were jumping on and there were all these ICOs um, yeah. and there really wasn't much there. And everybody was like, what do you, you know, what's your strategy? People it seemed to people were just, there was this new ICO every, every day for yeah. something that really had nothing. It was just vaporware. Yeah. Um, and which was not helpful, I think for the blockchain space. Cause at the end of the day, we needed to see greater adoption. We needed to see this become more ubiquitous just to kind of how we <clears> think <throat> about everyday, you know, interactions and transactions, but it was still, it still is not, fully there. Uh, and all of these people were what we, you know, focusing on these on chain solutions, versus really kind of figuring out uh, the infrastructure itself and, and how to make it uh, more accessible, specifically with, you know, I mean, you, you saw at the same time, folks like Jamie Dimon and all these others coming out, you know, with all of these negative opinions towards digital, digital currencies, crypto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but now over the last what couple of years, we, there's this really interesting moment that uh, I think that that I think we find ourselves in, and so kind of before we get into actually specifically what, what Goldfinch does, um, I think you you guys on, even on your website have been talking about like how this wouldn't have been possible even 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. So what what are from your perspective like as we think about what you're building with Goldfinch, why why now? What what is so special about this moment in in kind of our in our world where it makes these things possible? makes uh, digital currencies and um, this ability for kind of the way you described the, the blockchain to, to be where I can kind of own and control my own identity and information versus kind of selling it uh, all the time uh, on the internet. What, why, why now? Why is this a, a special moment for us? Yeah, so I guess, you know, I think to talk about the why now around, around Goldfinch, um, 
it's it's i mean i'll, I'll give the, the very quick you know five second on goldfinch is you know, we're, we're connecting all this crypto capital with lenders around the world especially in, in frontier markets and we think there's just a really good um, opportunity there but the the why now comes to there's kind of three trends that mike and i were seeing um <clears throat> and that that we felt made now possible and one is that so there's all this, this this money in the crypto ecosystem, and the crypto uh, holders are now looking for something to do with it, right? So I think for many years they were content to just kind of hodl, uh, as as the term is in the industry, or you know hold on to their crypto and hope that it appreciates. <laughs> but uh, now they're saying, hey, well, can I invest this somewhere? Can I save it? Can I give it to a business? Can I like what can I do with my crypto, right? And so there's this whole burgeoning decentralized finance ecospace, um, or you know DeFi as it's called, that is. Um, trying to build out these tools and ways for people to like do things with their crypto. And so just just the fact that people are now looking for stuff to do and they're looking for ways to earn yield was one big trend. And that's really like I popped up, I say, in the last 12 to 18 months. Another one is this rise of stable coins. And so stable coins, uh, if, you know, if the listeners aren't are familiar, are they're just like cryptocurrency, except they're they're basically pegged to the dollar, so they're stable. There are there are ones that aren't necessarily pegged to the dollar. You can have ones that are pegged to the euro or the yen, or you can have ones that aren't pegged to any fiat currency. But for, you know, most of them are pegged to the dollar. <clears throat> and so what that means, you get all these benefits, this programmability of the transactions, this programmable finance layer, this interoperability of crypto, but you don't get the volatility. And so that means that um, we can now, for instance, make loans to our businesses in a currency that they're familiar with. You know. Nobody wants to take a loan in Ethereum because obviously the price being so volatile, you have no idea what you're actually going to have to pay back. Um, but most businesses are willing to take loans in dollars, even those all around the world. They already take loans in dollars. There's also an ecosystem of hedging instruments and things like that that's built up around dollars. And so the fact that we can plug right into that is, is really critical. And there's now billions, tens of billions of dollars worth of these stable coins in the crypto ecosystem, again, just kind of looking for something to do. And so that was another big, big change over the last 18 months. And then uh, third thing is we're just seeing a lot more uh, growing fiat on and off ramps. So this is making it much easier for us to turn those crypto dollars into local currency. Uh, really, you know, almost anywhere in the world at this point. Um, <clears throat> places in you know, Africa, Europe, Latin America, Asia, they all are having uh, more and more liquid fiat on and off ramps. And so that lets you turn it from, say, uh, you know, USDC, which is this stable coin, into, say, Nigerian Naira. And um, that's becoming a much easier prospect. And so those three things are like, oh, operationally, a, for a business to be able to take a loan in crypto is no longer this like giant headache. You're not saying, hey, let me teach you about crypto. Hey, let me like all your customers <laughs> need to have wallets now. You don't need to do any of that. You can just say, do you want to access an entirely new source of capital that's maybe easier and can get you money faster? Cool. Like we got that. And so for a lot of these businesses, you know, it's a huge pain point for them to be raising capital is just there's a... You know, there's a big gap in the market that uh, you, I'm sure you guys are super well aware of between this kind of like, I'd say like a 100K or a couple hundred K to 5 million where these businesses who are our main customers, it's really hard for them to find financing in that range because, you know, a lot of the local capital markets in these uh, emerging markets are kind of weak or they're not as mature. And then the foreign capital that would enter the space, they need to be writing bigger checks. They need to be writing, you know, millions of dollars plus. And so that's where you end up seeing this gap that isn't really due to the riskiness of the business themselves. It's just uh, sort of the nature of the current economics make it tough for, um, for there to be checks in that range. And so that's, that's part of what we're going after. And this is part of why we think it's possible now. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things you mentioned about DeFi uh, is I think the moment is, is, really, is really important. Uh, the, the fact that these three things have come together, because like I said earlier, when we, were, when we started in 2017, those things didn't exist. There was the vision for it, and people were building some solutions with those things, like almost presuppose, like they almost presumed those things were already in place. Yep. And then when you actually get into it, so the ideas were not necessarily bad. And it's like, oh wow, this is when a when a fully realized universe with with a decentralized system is is in place, this is possible. But no, so the the building blocks had not yet been put in place to make that plausible. Yep. And I think what's really interesting is over the last 18 months, those those three kind of key ingredients to bake that cake, so to speak, have really kind of lined up to make it a really exciting time. Yeah. And it, it's similar, I think, to, you know, we remember what Webvan from the early days of the internet was trying to do food delivery, but it was, you know, whatever, 1999. 
and nobody had smartphones, nobody was used to using the internet, credit card payments weren't there, you couldn't do secure stuff in HTTPS. Like, there were just so many building blocks that weren't ready yet. Um, delivery networks and smartphones and stuff for your delivery drivers to make it efficient routing and stuff, none of that stuff was there. Um, but, you know, 10 years later, uh, a lot, or maybe even, maybe longer, maybe 14 years later, those things were there, and Instacart could come along and could start saying, we're gonna do this again. Um, and I remember hearing that you know Mark Andreessen when Instacart was raising, they were like a lot of VCs were having fears of ghost stories of like, oh, a company tried this before. <laughs> it's like, yeah, a company did try it before, but it, like the environment wasn't the same, you know. And like just in the past, there's been other companies trying crypto lending before, and they've all failed now, uh, up until now. And I think we're starting to see a lot more crypto lending really, really happen because these building blocks are, are finally there. Yeah. So you, you, you guys recently wrote, you and Mike, uh, that DeFi is a massive opportunity to transform access to capital, um, which at Access Ventures we're, we're super um, focused on. But it will only be possible once it can make loans without collateral. Uh, that's what will finally open crypto lending to most people in the world. So talk to me this. Uh, so if you could walk us through like Goldfinch, what's the premise behind it? Um, and this idea of, of not requiring collateral. So you mentioned Nigeria. So what does it look like? for a borrower in Nigeria to access capital and where does Goldfinch fit in? Yeah, totally. So um, I think on that, that point, it's worth bringing up a little bit of uh, what crypto lending looks like now with the over collateralization. And then sure. that'll help contrast and, and realize why what we're doing is, is different and interesting for the crypto space and for you know, these borrowers in Nigeria. So um, right now, there's, there's actually billions of dollars getting lent and borrowed on crypto, but uh, all of it is what's called over collateralized. And so what we mean by that is um, in order to borrow like $100, you need to put up $150 as collateral, right? And so to most people, you would look at that and they would go, is that even a loan? Like what, what, do, you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Why am I, if I'm giving you $150, what, what's the point of me taking $100? I have the money. Um, and that's a totally fair response. <laughs> it's like, it's true in a lot of ways, but there's, uh, the use case is, is for basically for traders. So people who want to go long on Bitcoin, if you can borrow $100 of Bitcoin, even if you put up 150, you can buy more Bitcoin and if the price of Bitcoin goes up, you can pay back your loan and you've still made money. And so this is basically getting leverage on your trades. And so that's a, that works. It's fine. It's, it's getting billions of dollars into the ecosystem where there's like a lot of tools and stuff that's been built that can be transferred over for other use cases, but that's a very niche use case. And so that's really what we meant. We're like, if we really want to open this up to the rest of the world and get people using this money, we have to find a way to make it not over collateralized because the whole reason that most people take loans is because they do not have the money. And so that's, that's what we meant there. And then in terms of, uh, you know, these bars in Nigeria and how this, how this works for them, is that, is that kind of what we should get now? Yeah, like, that's how helpful. Work? Yeah. Well, and so, I think that the third point, like where you talked about, like there's these on off ramps is very critical because what you described as these over collateralized loans are still people taking out these and, and they're using it basically within the crypto, crypto universe to kind yeah. of hedge against, you know, future, future potential for, for Bitcoin, so to speak. But now actually to translate that into a real dollar loan for a person in Nigeria that really has no understanding of the cryptos, just a, just an easier, seamless way to access capital for what they do day in and day out. I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, and your, yeah. your ability is to say like, look, we've got this whole system um, on the blockchain and yet we haven't figured out how to get, you know, dollars and cents into the, into the bank or the pocket pocketbooks or the, you know, in, or into the hands of these borrowers that desperately need it just to put food on the table. And so I think yeah. that's a, a really important distinction. So yeah, for the, in Nigeria, how, do, how does Goldfinch um, work with these these crypto holders that are looking for some sort of yield and, mm -hmm. and help this this borrower in Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's just walk through how how that works today. And so to, for some context, we are we are live today on Ethereum, and we've already dispersed about a million dollars worth of loans to our first three borrowers, um, who are one in Latin America, another in Nigeria, another in Southeast Asia. And so we can let's walk through the Nigeria case. So this we work with this uh, borrower. It's called QuickCheck, and they make um, sort of ML powered loans. They have like a data science team. They take data off people's phones. They're able to underwrite them very quickly, and then uh, give them personal loans. <clears throat> and so they, um, you know, as I was saying, there's this big gap in the market. So they there's there's trouble finding uh, loans for that business um, in the range of this kind of few hundred k to five million is is tough. And so when we talk with them, they're like. 
yeah, sort of if you're willing to make loans, that thing, like we're willing to talk with you and we're willing to use crypto. And so the way that this, this works in practice, you know, we have created smart contracts that live on the Ethereum blockchain. And we went out and raised a, a million dollar pool that we would use for lending from um, you know, just, just people in our network, uh, individuals and businesses who have uh, extra crypto stable coin that they want to lend out, earn some return. They put that money into our smart contract. So off the bat, that's actually one interesting component. Like we didn't raise a fund. We didn't raise, we didn't, there's no legal entity that we started. There's no SPV. There's, there's no nothing. They, they just, we just said, hey, do you want to invest? Put money in the smart contract. And they did. That was it. <clears throat> um, so like that's already, a, you know, innovation in a way of like, it was just much easier to create that quote unquote fund, if you will. Um, Very sure. Yeah. And, um, and so they, they deposited money to this smart contract, this USDC. That's one of these stable coins I was mentioning. And then we, as the Goldfinch team, we found QuickCheck and we said, hey, uh, you know, we think this is a great business. We want to make a loan. And so we worked out an interest rate with them. We worked out a credit limit and we worked out a repayment cycle, that whole thing. We actually signed a legal agreement with them. So in that sense, it was relatively normal. And then for them on their side, what it looks like is we said, OK, in order to access this money, you need to use a, a crypto wallet. And so they, uh, since they're a business, they're willing to learn some stuff here, right? And they, that's fine for them. There's just one person at their company who needs to use this wallet. They come to our front end. We have like a website, um, you know, app.goldfinch.finance. And uh, it lets them, uh, it, you know, they come on, they use their wallet, and they're able to draw down from this pool up to their credit limit. And so they're able to draw down, you know, several hundred thousand dollars in USDC. And then they go to an exchange. So they went to like, you know, Binance. And uh, Binance is a big global exchange that has, uh, you know, entities kind of all around the world. And they turn that money into their local currency, into Naira. <clears throat> and from there, they, a, um, you know, they, they go about their business, right? They, they do things like normal. And so by doing that, uh, that is getting money into the hands of all these people into Nigeria. And, you know, just for them alone, we're talking about, you know, thousands of people who've been able to basically get access to this capital that was sitting in the crypto ecosystem that otherwise wouldn't, that, that connection couldn't have been made. And so, um, you know, our relationship is with, with QuickCheck. It's not directly with the end borrowers. And so QuickCheck pays us back on a monthly cadence and they do everything in reverse. So they take some, uh, some Naira, they end up turning it into USDC, and then they, they pay us back. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> and I think that what you figured out, it, you know, we have some examples for that kind of on the traditional finance side, just these intermediaries that are able to aggregate um, and then to basically provide, um, you know, the credit for these, these, these uh, lending agencies to, to then go and work with, with businesses on the ground. And so uh, it's a pretty interesting thing. I think, yeah, the innovation around the smart contract, it, it's, it's nice that you paused there because I think sometimes we, we kind of buzz past this, this stuff, but it's pretty revolutionary what, what you were able to do uh, by creating a smart contract um, and, and to gain access to capital in a sense that now is, is supporting businesses in, in Nigeria and places around the world. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> with the smart contract, I mean, was that, a, was that a pretty easy process or is that something that it was tedious or is that something that, that came rather simple? Is, what was that like for in developing kind of the smart contract uh, for, for you all? Yeah, I mean, so developing smart contracts is, is tough to do, to do well. Um, it is, you know, I'd say it's like any engineering in some ways in that, um, you know, you need talented engineers to build things that are safe, to build things that are going to work correctly. Um, we, so we do, you know, the smart contract isn't just an empty vessel to hold, hold money. Um, we also have a lot of logic to make sure that the accounting of the loan is done correctly, that we know when they're supposed to be paying back, um, that we have, you know, there are you know, penalties if they don't pay back on time. Um, there are these limits. We have to make sure that they can only take out the amount of money that they say they can take out. The interest rate needs to get calculated correctly. Um, and of course, um, one, one of the big things about working on the blockchain is that the Ethereum ecosystem is a much more um, slightly technical adversarial environment than a normal software development. So because everything is in one big pool, well, like anyone can kind of access your contracts, right? Anyone can see, like, see your code. Anyone can look at your functions. Um, you just don't have nearly as much control over the environment um, because it's this one big shared place. So a lot of people refer to it kind of like a, a dark forest um, or like a, a jungle. You know, um, you, you got to be worried. And so security is a much more um, involved uh, and much more important aspect 
of, of developing on the Ethereum ecosystem as opposed to doing normal let's say, web development. And yeah, and then, so I mean, it sorry, took keep us going. months. Uh, it took us months to to build this, and we got you get your code audited in the the blockchain world, and so our code has been audited by an, like a third party firm who is their whole purpose there is to look for um, bugs and exploits that could be possible for um, for you know attackers to to exploit, in which case they might be able to steal money from your smart contracts. Hacks have happened repeatedly in the Ethereum ecosystem, and um, they, they continue to happen. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous, dangerous world out there in, in Ethereum and you got to do your smart contract, right? Which is why it's, it's tough, but we have, um, you know, fantastic engineers, uh, on the team that we've hired, uh, from Coinbase and, um, you know, I'm working to, to build one as well. And we use these third party firms and try and follow best practices. And, and I think the industry as a whole really is making significant progress here. You know, it's moving so fast and what's great about software and, and um, the Ethereum ecosystem is like every time one of these hacks happen, it's it's another way for the whole ecosystem to level up its security game. Like everyone can make the improvement and then we can like sort of shut off that attack vector and everyone learns from it. The, the ecosystem is very open in that way. Like all of the attacks have postmortems, all the audit reports are public. <clears throat> um, so everyone's really like working together to create a safe system, which is why I think some people can get scared like, oh, they see these hacks happening and they think, oh, I don't want to put my money into Ethereum. But I think this is... Um, this is an anti-fragile ecosystem. And as every, every one of these problems actually just makes the whole ecosystem stronger. And within a few years, I would not be surprised if this is you know, the safest place to put your money. Yeah. No, I think that's helpful. And I'm glad you took some time to go into kind of the difficulty and the complexity of building a smart contract. Uh, because I think that's important to remember. And that's essentially what your team at Goldfinch is doing, is you're working to make this secure and seamless. Uh, and it's, it's not just you know, a piece of paper like a legal document or, you know, a term sheet that might have been uh, more familiar with investors, but but something that really uh, needs to be protected and tested and audited and, and proven and constantly refined and updated to ensure the, the security and compliance and, and all of those things, uh, which right. is which is super important. Uh, because you're talking about again, your your goal is is to get money into the hands of borrowers that have no knowledge of of the blockchain. Yep. Uh, to help help businesses in emerging markets, but you can't do that if you lose everybody's money. You know, so it's kind of, you've got to yeah. create you know a good smart contract. You've got to create something that's trustworthy, reliable, something that people are willing to put their money into, something that's going to generate yield for them. Um, because one of the things I wanted to talk about too is I think sometimes the 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 type of business you, you guys have been building at Goldfinch. Some people would look at that and say, well that's concessionary or they're, they're, they're doing good work. They're helping businesses in Africa or Mexico or wherever. Um, but those are, those are high risk, low probability return. And so in order to do that, we're actually going to have to then be willing to sacrifice return on our part, mm -hmm. but that's not at all what you're trying to build here. Like talk yeah. to me a little bit about like you're, you're really building like what it, if I'm going to lend uh, through your smart contract, what type of, what type of yield am I, am I, should I be expecting from that? Yeah, so right now we're uh, offering our investors, you know, the, we say sort of 10 to 15% um, per year in dollar terms is the, is the range there. And yeah, I mean, just to, to speak, we, we definitely don't want to be doing, you know, the, the high risk uh, loans uh, where we think there's low probability of return, right? We want this to be safe uh, returns, or at least as safe as you reasonably can get um, with, with returns like this. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, we're working kind of with the same companies, same deals that you would often see private credit funds working, working with, um, you know, and in fact, a lot of our underwriting and our um, deal structuring is, is done by uh, Renick Pally, who is uh, the founder of um, Stratos Technologies. And so he's got a lot of experience um, doing these, these exact kind of underwriting deals and, and structuring and stuff. And so, you know, we're not, we're not taking a fast and loose approach to the companies we work with. We want to make sure we're working with, with great companies. Um, and this is kind of part of the whole thing here is we think there's, there's actually a lot of great opportunities for, for return for people to get. And, you know, in, in a lot, especially the, the developed markets of you know, America and Europe, like bonds are super low right now. And it doesn't look like those are going to change anytime soon. And so people are really just like starving for, for opportunities to get yield. Um, but yet you see these private credit funds that are so offering like pretty strong returns in like the seven to 15% range per year. And we're saying like, well, can we, can we give everyone access to that? We're like, <clears throat> we really want to be able to try and level that, that playing field. And we think crypto has a really unique opportunity to do that um, in the, in the, the you know, medium term. 
Um, this is, I mean, this kind of gets a little bit, because right now our, our stuff is uh, restricted to accredited investors in the US or international investors. But um, our, our V2, which I, I can't really give too many details about that right now, but uh, rest assured that our, our V2 system, which we want to be much more decentralized, um, we want to make sure that that has access for everybody to be able to invest yeah. in these kind of deals. Well, and I love that. I mean, because I think there's, you know, if, if we were to sit here and talk about like Goldfinch should be doing these things, but the reality is you've got to, you've got to, you've got to slow walk this. There's, there's, you've got to build the smart contract. You've got to beta test it. So you've done that with a million dollars in these kind of three different partnerships. You've got to, you know, demonstrate you can actually do this. Then you start to, you know, incrementally grow that over time. And I think that's, that's just wisdom. You know, that's wisdom in business and just in life is just to kind of like, hey, we've got this vision for where we could go. And then the, the, and things are in place to make that possible. Um, but we don't want to do this and just, you know, become yet another type of venture that just like, yep, I told you so, you know, kind of like, uh, the, you mentioned the Instacarts of the world, people, this, this ghost fear of like, well, somebody has already tried this. It's like, yeah, I mean, for sure. And we could be one of those things, but we want to, we, there's a, there's a time and a place and an opportunity for us to kind of go slowly, incrementally and, and, you know, in the next five years, see something really really important happened. So yeah, uh, it's, totally. it's good That's to hear you say that. Iterative mindset of Silicon Valley that we're, we, you know, Mike and I have both been working in tech for a long time. And so we, we want to bring that, that mindset here as well. <clears throat> um, we got this, this pilot off the ground and we have plans even the next months to be just adding, you know, one more thing, one more thing, piloting new, new things, asking ourselves, what are the hypotheses that we're, that we're missing that still need to be tested out and try and test those uh, as, as we go. And what, but we think it's, I gotta say, I don't think it's gonna be five years. I think we can have something really cool <laughs> within maybe even another year. Yeah. That's great. And the speed of crypto, yeah, I say five years, it's, <laughs> it's a lot, it's been a lot faster of late, which is great. So give me a, give me a vision. So from Blake's perspective, um, Goldfinch, what, what are you really, what is the, the fundamental underlying thing? Um, access to capital, um, uh, businesses and emerging markets, like, I've got to believe that what you're building right now has applications in other. So give me a vision of the world um, as this thing continues to mature. What does the flow of money look like? How does it impact business? How does it impact communities uh, like communities like in Nigeria, uh, where access to capital is one of the biggest inhibitors for economic progress, economic mobility, prosperity for individuals? Like, what are we able to potentially realize with, with a solution like this? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if we want to yeah, really look at that kind of longer term vision, I mean, <clears throat> I would say that a, a lot of our kind of vision here is, is based on or based on two, two like core beliefs that, that we have at, at Goldfinch. One is that um, investors are around the world are going to be looking for new sources of yield and they're going to be demanding access to these new sources of yield. And we just you see that in, in the low bond yield environments that we have that probably aren't changing. You see that in. Uh, increased participation in the retail stock market, at least you know in the developed worlds, all these people are just like, I need something to do with my money because I can't get any return in, in bonds anymore. Um, and then another belief is around just more and more economic activity is going to be happening on chain. And we think, uh, you know, you see versions of this uh, actually with some of our partners in, in Nigeria. It's it's really interesting. We've talked to three different partners there, and uh, some who work with businesses and some who work with consumers, and they're all interested in giving their customers crypto wallets because the customers are demanding it. And you might think it's because they want to like speculate on Bitcoin or, or ETH, but it's not. It's because they view holding on to crypto as a safer alternative than holding on to the Naira. And so they want to be holding on to crypto dollars like USDC because they're like, I want my money in dollars, but they can't get dollars in the normal ecosystem, right? And so from our perspective, if you look at that, that's like saying, oh man, like, Merchants are asking for crypto accounts. Consumers are asking for crypto accounts. They think it's a safer place. It's inevitable that those consumers and merchants are going to start interacting directly on the crypto ecosystem between each other, right? And I think this is going to be happening in a lot of places around the world. And so um, that those things together, we think like eventually crypto is going to be creating a system where someone can like extend a loan for any transaction that happens in the world, right? And a, you know, a way to think about that is it's kind of like you're building an open source Visa Rails. Right, right now, like when you swipe your credit card uh, and you pay with your Visa card, a big bank is going to be providing the credit to actually make that happen. Right, Visa is not the one who's actually providing the credit there. And so we're saying, well, if you have open source Visa Rails, like what if anyone can be can be that lender? Right, it's not just the big banks who are providing the credit. What if any person in the world could do that, or a smart contract could do it? 
right? So uh, imagine this example for someone in, if someone in you know, Lagos wants to get their car repaired because it, it broke down the other day, they go to the <clears throat> repair shop and one of our smart contracts provided with credit through people who are looking for opportunities to earn yield, they provide it to a smart contract which can look at this person's, maybe uh, look at some of their history on chain or understand what they're doing. They can send the money directly to the repair shop in Lagos um, from the smart contract. And then later on, they can get uh, repaid because maybe that person's employer is, is paying them back on chain and we can see, all right, well, you know, they can, they're going to be having an income so we trust that they're going to be able to pay this back at some point and they can pay back the smart contract. And all that stuff, can, that full flow of funds, that full life cycle can happen on chain. And, um, and that money theoretically could have come from anyone, could have come from someone in Siberia, could have come from someone in Latin America. And all the people were getting to participate in the economic um, sort of uh, activity and gains of that transaction. So I think that's, that's really this, this real vision of, of crypto. That's great. Is there anything at this point? Because I mean, it sounds like, um, like you said, there, there are things in place. Is there anything right now that get, kind of gives you pause or um, you're concerned about? You mentioned some of the security issues on the Ethereum network and some other things. But like, as you look at the, the landscape of, of, of blockchain and kind of where, where we are today, is there anything that you're still kind of watching and, and just like, okay, I want to, I want to, this gives me pause or this still yet needs to be developed or there's too still much too, too much vaporware out there so it's too, still too confusing or the mainstream what is it that you you look at and you're like these these things still need to improve in order for us to fully realize that that vision for the future yeah so i think there's probably a couple things um one is generically referred to as scaling solutions for the blockchain so um you know the, right now the, the ethereum ecosystem is just painfully, woefully expensive and slow. And uh, things cost an absolutely absurd amount of money. Like even the most mm -hmm. simple transactions can sometimes run into be $100 worth of gas fees, you know, and for any normal person in the world, that's prohibitive. <clears throat> and so there, the good news, however, is that there are a bunch of teams and a bunch of money and people have been working for years now on these scaling solutions. And so we're starting to see the fruits of that labor just now. It's not, it's not quite there ready for prime time, but um, big projects are just start, they're having, starting to have like alpha versions that are on like what's called a layer two, which is just a, another term for a scaling solution. Um, or they're, they're, they're piloting on some alternative blockchains that are much faster. And so when we're starting to see bridges that can like move money between these blockchains and things like that. And so that, that world, I think, is going to come a long way in the next year or two. Um, and when that is in place, that's going to really open up the design space of what kind of applications are possible, who can be using it realistically, because again, I can't send money to, to a repair shop in Lagos for a hundred dollar loan. It could cost me a hundred dollars in gas just to send <laughs> money there. And so we have to get past that, but we're going to, and I said, there's a bunch of different approaches. A bunch of teams are working on this. There's like, you know, six or seven or eight different teams that are all like really legit with great investment behind them. And they've all been working for years to build this stuff. So like we're getting there. And then I think along with that, um, we need simpler wallets. <clears throat> we need wallets that everyday people can use. Um, and when I say wallet here, this, this is like a wallet that a user controls, right? So when you go onto your account on like Coinbase or Binance, that's not considered a wallet because they control that. Um, so in the crypto term, when we say your wallet, that's you control it, it's your keys, it's your money. Uh, usually means there's no way to like re easily uh, recover that if you forget your, your private key or your password. Um, but this is part of the thing where people are developing new ways to make these wallets more seamless and uh, give you recovery options that um, or if you do forget your password, there's a way to there's a way to, to recover that. Um, things like social recovery are, get, are becoming possible. So this is like if you have your wallet, what can I say like my mom and my best friend and this other colleague I know, they can all um, if I lose my thing, they can just like reset it. And, and say, okay, this new address, this is Blake as far as the, the blockchain is concerned. <clears throat> and so um, doing that and, and building in things with like two-factor authentication on people's phones, there's like, there's a lot of work that people are doing on the wallet front that again, I think is also gonna be coming a long way in the next year or so. And is also gonna be helped a lot by scaling technologies. So that thing needs to happen. Um, and then I would say just in terms of pause, like not from a technical perspective, I think the regulatory stuff could be very um, difficult uh, over the coming years. I think, honestly, blockchain is, is it's empowering a lot of people to be able to be their own bank in a way. And that's a that's a scary, disruptive thing for a lot of governments. And so I, and it, it's also going to be um, 
pushing very hard against capital controls that countries have uh, for their for their you know for their country. And so I think those two things mean there there's a bit of a collision course between the blockchain and the current financial regimes around the world. And um, I, I think the blockchain is a train you can't stop, but um, that doesn't mean it's not going to be a rocky road.